Uh, my name is Jeff Forcier, and I'm the lead maintainer of the Fabric project, which is a Python library for deploying to servers, deploying web applications, and doing sysadmin tools. It's a, it's a high-level SSH wrapper. Uh, I had a need to do uh, both kind of basic server provisioning as well as just interrogation of servers to you know, do things like I have 20 servers and I want to know what uh, version of the kernel they all have or which ones are lacking certain you know, tools that I need or how much disk space they have, things like that. Um, and also to just deploy web applications. And there's a lot of tools out there. There's like a, like a t another Python tool called Funct, which I hadn't heard of at the time, which came out later on, but uh, people use it in like the Fedora world. Uh, there's Capistrano, which is a very similar tool in the Ruby world and Rails. Um, and in fact, when, uh, I, I, when I took over Fabric from the original uh, creator, Christian uh, Hansen, he had largely been making it as a Python clone of Capistrano, so it was very, very inspired by the Capistrano API mm -hmm. and the way it executed things. Um, and then when I took over, uh, I looked at it and Capistrano and a few other tools, and Fabric was early on enough that it was pretty easy to understand the code base. It was all one file, only like maybe a thousand or two thousand lines of code. Um, and so I thought, all right, I have different ideas about how I want this to work. Because um, on a technical level, you run Python functions uh, that are your ta called tasks. So you're saying, you know, uh, sign onto the server, see if Apache is installed. If Apache is not installed, install it. Then upload my config file, you know, my custom config file. Um, and that sort of if-else type of uh, logic wasn't really capable for like more than one server with tools like CAP or early Fabric because when they call uh, run and pseudo functions, uh, which are what actually talk to the server, they, um, they run for all the servers at once. So your Python function, your task runs only one time, and then your run call would run on all, like say, five servers. And the problem with that is you can't get back a meaningful answer about if-else type logic with five servers at once. It didn't make sense. You'd get back a list of five answers. You can't work with that. The logic just doesn't flow. It's not like a shell script. Um, so I flipped it on its head and basically said, look, the function's going to run once per server. And then the run and pseudo calls are a single process response. So that allows you to write stuff, like I said, if Apache is installed, do something else, do something different. Sure. Um, for the most part, it complements them. It, the, the core use case of it is really just the SSH wrapping aspect, the push, you know, like I said, uh, just calling commands on servers at your whim when you want it to happen um, in, in some kind of configurable order. Um, and you can use some tools like Chef and Puppet in that way as well. And in fact, some people combine the two and use Fabric to drive, say, Chef Solo, which is Chef's run stuff on demand tool. Um, and so it actually pairs pretty nicely with them in that respect. And um, as you saw the other day at that meetup, a lot of folks are using Fabric for that exact task. So I think it works well for that. For this, the I want to be pushing things around and, and ticking the little bits all over the uh, all over your servers. Um, whereas the pull-based stuff are more about I have this big infrastructure and I am okay with it managing itself on its own time. And that's kind of a philosophical split that you see. Some people would rather control things and have the, use the push uh, way of doing things. In terms of actually provisioning servers and how you write the, the configuration language and stuff, Fabric can take over for Chef and Puppet. That's what I did at a previous job where I had a large amount of Fabric code, you know, code on top of Fabric that did all of the check if something's installed. If it's not installed, install it, upload files. Um, but that gets unwieldy after a while, partly because you have to write a lot of the code that people who do Chef and Puppet have already done. So that's why I'm personally looking at, at Chef for the config management aspects and leaving Fabric in the niche of, like I said, being agile and being push-based. And so either running, you know, Chef stuff instead of running more Fabric code um, or just using for, for quick uh, ad hoc queries of a sort, saying, all right, uh, what's going on with these servers? Or, you know, I'd, I'd really like to see uh, how much disk space is being used for a certain folder on, you know, this subset of servers. You know, like, um, as I used it the other day, for example, look at our PostgreSQL clusters. And I was curious to see how they all compared to each other in terms of how much a certain um, folder structure was using. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't, it wasn't a partition, because like if you're using proper monitoring tools, you can get that kind of answer out of them. But this was a, a more granular question that could only really be answered by running a shell command. Right. Um, and of course, also the other major thing that people are always going to use it for, I think, is deploying code to servers, because that's a very push-based thing, right. uh, at least for now. Some people's minds are changing about that. Uh, like I think it was, uh, was it Andrew Godwin? He said that in that meetup that he 
uh, was actually using Puppet for everything, including some code deployments. Right, but he but said he had to kick Puppet to tell it to go execute something. Right, so and, and so, exactly, and so for that he still used Fabric, and, and I think most people are going to take a while, if ever, to come around to that mindset, just because you want to have the control of when you're deploying your code. It just doesn't quite, it, most people are not comfortable leaving that up to a pull-based setup. So far on the sprint, it's mostly been smaller things, just trying to take other people's patches and encourage other folks who are new to the project to just kind of dive in and get their hands dirty, which I think a lot of sprints like to do that. Folks who've never really contributed uh, are drawn to that kind of thing. And in fact, just this morning, I merged something by um, a guy named Thomas, and he'd never contributed to open source before, and that was his first patch, and cool. I put it in. Um, so it's mostly minor features and bug fixes for now, and then the rest of today and tomorrow, I'm going to be focusing on some larger stuff. So. There's uh, namespaces for tasks. Right now, when Fabric it looks at your fab file, even if you're drawing from multiple files, it just shows you one big list of tasks. Now it'll let you have them in you know subsections and stuff. Um, and the other even bigger one is uh, the task decorator, uh, which uh, Travis Swicegood has been working on for a long time. And I'm finally going to get to pull that in and take his work and, and stick it in there. And that, that'll let you uh, specif uh, be explicit about what tasks, what functions in your Python code are tasks to be executed, and which ones might be subroutines or other callables that just kind of got in there. So in the past, it was explicit. Now it's going to have the option of using an explicit decorator. And that'll also bring us down the road towards having, uh, having object-oriented task objects, which opens the door for a lot of nice new features, which we really need. Right now, the way I have it set up is we have a Redmine instance, which keeps track of tickets um, and does some source code management as well. Um, but most of the, uh, so I'd say it's about 75% of the requests that come in, come in through GitHub. So we, we have a mirror to GitHub. So uh, anything that ever gets committed to our canonical repo goes immediately to GitHub. So it, it can be used pretty uh, sensibly. You can't re people can't really tell that we're not technically hosting it on GitHub because it's there. And then uh, a decent subset of people still submit patches through the ticket tracker. Um, or the mailing list, um, but they kind of come from all over, and it's it's been neat, you know, setting that up because there's a lot of different people with a lot of different use cases, so it helps both see what direction things should go in, um, and also it it's the same thing I think anyone deals with where some tickets get filed and you say, well, that could be useful, but I don't know if it fits in with how I think the project should work. I don't think it, uh, maybe I don't think it's a common enough use case, or I don't think it's really a best practice or whatnot. So a lot of times I have to make judgment calls on whether I think something fits. Um, but most of the time, I'm pretty happy to take what people get in. It's most of the time I see it and I go, yeah, that would be useful for a lot of folks. Um, the other big kind of gotcha is trying not to get like the API overburdened. So if you add way too many features, eventually, you know, just just, just like Microsoft Office, there's just too much crap going on. Um, and so that's another reason where you say, like, uh, maybe this doesn't work in Core Fabric, but we can add it to Contrib, or, you know, you should release your own library that hooks into it. Um, that's another thing that'll be coming in the near future is a plugin setup, hopefully, which would, again, help alleviate that sort of I want this in Fabric um, right. drive that some people have and say, but at least it's your own thing, and it'll show up in the namespace. There, there are some tools out there that kind of bleed into the same space that Fabric does, and so the question becomes, do we use that and you know get rid of some of our own code and say, look, we're going to incorporate this as a dependency, like stuff like uh, things like Paver, for example, which is a, a more full-featured kind of task runner and build tool. Um, some people have said maybe we should use that for it because it's got, you know, right now our, our uh, make-like features are relatively basic, the, the stuff if you're just doing local-only things, um, you know, stuff like that. Um, there's other stuff out there, such as ExecNet, Pyro, and uh, Pushy, which uh, let you do remote Python execution. So instead of calling shell, shell commands, you could hook up to an, a remote Python interpreter and call Python code. Um, and again, that's not something that a lot of people are looking for, but it, it could definitely be very useful to have. And so those are, again, third-party projects that we, we might end up integrating with and saying, here's you know, an integration hook with it, or you know, making it an actual dependency and using it as an, an alternate way of getting commands onto a server. Oh, man, that's always a hard question to answer. <laughs> um, I really enjoyed some of the talks. Um, like uh, Christopher Groskopf's talk on impossible deadlines yeah, was really, yeah, that was really neat. Um, they're all really neat. You know, Alex Martelli is always fun to watch. Um, Gary Bernhardt is really cool, and he had a couple of talks that I went to, and those were both really interesting. Yeah. Just about, uh, one about unit testing, one about his uh, bit backer backup 
software and just kind of how he implemented it in Python and the problems he ran into. I think I like that a lot, seeing what real people have used in real software and what lessons they could learn from it instead of it being like an academic sort of thing. Right. I think I think the best thing though about Python is just meeting people that you only talk to online. That's the number one thing. Yeah, it's just interfacing with folks either you haven't seen in a year or that you've never met in person. So, yeah, it's been great. It's it's been funny too. Uh, multiple times I've seen people near me who said, you know, I love Sprint because I can just walk over and grab so and so and I need to ask them a question about their project. So like you know, if you need help with Django, like Alex and uh, Alex and uh, Yanis are both here. Uh, you know, if you're doing stuff with Mock, you know, um, Void Space is here and so forth. So. Fabric. Yes, or fabric. Yeah, no. I mean, I've had I've had uh, at least six to ten fabric users and developers here uh, over different periods of time who've either actually contributed or at least just been here and talked about ideas and stuff, which has been great. Uh, I finally got to meet Morgan Goose, who's been one of my main helpers and contributors to fabric. So I'd never met him in person, and it was really awesome to hang out with him. Yeah. Really great to give back to the open source community, and everybody says that. And it's kind of cliche, but it is true to know that a tool that you're working on, other people are using and getting stuff done with. Really excited about where it's going in the future, just because now that we've got our 1.0 release out the door, um, there's nothing in the way to prevent us from just putting out a lot of new features. So I'm really excited for the, the pace of development is going to go up a lot, I think.